I'm so very happy to introduce you this morning to our guest preacher, the Reverend Ted Frost. Ted serves as the executive director of our United Methodist Foundation and the Illinois Great Rivers Conference. They manage investments for the conference and local churches and also assist congregations in stewardship and, and financial planning. Uh, the most important thing to know about Ted is he is from Texas and is a graduate of Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University <laughs> in Dallas, Texas. So let's welcome Reverend Ted Frost to the First United Methodist Church. Thanks, Richard. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an honor it is to be here, and I'm so glad that I have been invited. I've been blessed all morning long. Um, as Victor said, uh, part of my responsibility with the conference is to talk about stewardship. We all know what that means, right? That means leave your checkbook at home and hide your wallet. The word has come to have negative connotations in the church today, but it's my theology that if you say, I believe, you're doing stewardship, good, bad, or indifferent. From the way you greet your family in the morning, that's stewardship. The way you work with people throughout the day, that's stewardship. The way that you respond to that person on the street who's in need, that's stewardship. The way that you respond to the commitment you made, if you're a member of this church, to support its ministries with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, that's stewardship. And it's my theology as well that every sermon should be a stewardship sermon, in that every sermon should remind us of God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, and God looked at this creation and said, this is good. But then, but then God took the dirt from the earth, blew the breath of life into it, called it woman and called it man and said, now this, this is very good. And we'll share this creation together. Every sermon should remind us that while we were yet in the womb, God called our name. Every sermon, I think, should point us to Christ, the one who hung on the cross for the redemption of our sins. And then every sermon should give us an opportunity to respond to that great news. We have a creator who's given us life. We have a savior who gives us eternal life. And so what I would like to do this morning is to take a look at a passage of scripture that I'm going to read and see if we can find God Almighty, the creator in it, see how it might point us to Christ. And then my prayer is not just this morning, but every morning of your life, you will respond to this good news. Now, I searched and searched and tried to find a really good passage of Scripture for stewardship. And if you would like, you can pick up a pew Bible and turn to Mark chapter 6. I'm going to start with verse 14 and read through 29. King Herod had heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and that's the reason that powers are at work in him. But others said, it's Elijah. And others said, it's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent him to, be arrest, to arrest John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportune time came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she, play, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back into the king with a request. I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of his regard for his oath and his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent his soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head back on a platter and gave it to the girl. The girl gave it to her mother, and when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come now to feed on the bread of life, your word. Help us to feed on it in our hearts. Help it to grow our faith. Help us to become stronger and better disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you and a blessing to those with ears who can hear. Amen. Well, what a wonderful story. Comes right after the twelve had been sent out to do the teaching and the preaching and the healing. A wonderful story about Jesus training his disciples. Right after this is that wonderful passage of scripture we love to hear about the feeding of the 5,000. How those two little fish and loaves just multiplied and multiplied. And in the middle of these two beautiful passages of scripture is one of the most carnal stories I think we could think of. A man loses his head. Look in the papers. It's there even today. How can we find God Almighty, our creator, in a story such as this? Could it be, my friends, that God calls us the church to be about reaching out to the carnal world and bringing light where there's darkness, bringing love where there is hate, bringing peace where there is war? That's where I think God Almighty is in this passage of Scripture, calling us the church to be about the ministry and bringing the kingdom right where we are today. How does this point us to Christ? Well, I think the very first verse is really the most important verse of this passage. Jesus had become known. Even King Herod had heard of it. Everybody in this passage of Scripture is very well known. King Herod is well known. Who was invited to the party? All the important people were invited to the party. Everybody knew those people. Herodias, the daughter, she became known. We must remember she was probably not wearing a cute little tutu and some tap shoes. She so impressed the audience, the king was ready to give half the kingdom away. In all of this, Jesus had become known. That makes sense to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in Christ will have hope for eternal life. But we aren't supposed to tell the story. No, I think God calls us, the church, to continue to help Jesus become known. And so the question is, how do we do that? Because I think we struggle with that in the church today sometimes, especially in the Methodist church, because that's the one I'm related to. But we struggle with that, becoming known. Now, one of the things I like to do on Saturday morning when I'm at home and have time is I put our TV on channel 32 that's where all the old westerns are. Anybody like the old westerns? Anything with a duke in it, I'll watch it. Uh, Robert Duvall has become one of my favorites since the making of Lonesome Dove. He, by the way, he made a made-for-TV movie a couple of years ago called Broken Trail. And in that, there was some really good theology. Uh, there are three deaths in that movie, and the character of Robert Duvall says this at each of the funerals. We're travelers through this world. From the sweet grass to the packing house, from birth to death, we travel between the eternities. My friends, that's good theology. We're here this morning, traveling between the eternities. But now my favorite Western movie is Outlaw Josie Wales. Just absolutely love that. I could start at the beginning if we had time. We'd go through. The... That movie is about a man who becomes known. At the beginning of the movie, he loses his wife and his son and finally ends up being a man who helps an elderly woman and her granddaughter get to property in Texas that her son had purchased. He became known. There is, in that movie, I think, a scene that reminds me of how we, the church, sometimes feel today. One of the heroes in that movie is an Indian chief, and he pontificates about the plight of the Native Americans in this one scene and says... We were invited to Washington, D.C. They dressed us up like Abram Lincoln. We visited with the Secretary of War, and he told us we had endeavored to persevere. And the newspapers the next day says, Indians endeavor to persevere. My friends, I think that's where we, the church, sometimes live today. We are endeavoring to persevere. When, in fact, I think God calls us, as disciples of Jesus Christ, to become known. 
So the question is, how do we do that? How do we become known? Well, let me encourage you to read this good book. That will help you. But as United Methodists, from time to time, we are brilliant. If you'll open up your United Methodist hymnal to page 38, we have written this down pretty concisely in the United Methodist Church. Page 38, halfway down, under the red number 15, is the question that's asked anyone who joins the United Methodist Church. It says, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness, we added in 2008. My friends, do you know that's how Jesus became known? How many times in the New Testament do we read about Jesus pulling away from the crowd to go and do what? To pray. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for the world. We become known by being a praying people. We need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray for our families. We need to pray for our church and our pastor and our community. We need to be praying for our world. We become known by our prayers, our presence. Jesus was very present. Only three times do we read in the New Testament where Jesus is at the temple. The rest of the time, where is he present? in the world. And who's he hanging with? People we wouldn't like. They didn't like him back then. My friends, I'm glad you're here this morning for corporate worship. Your presence, I think, is helpful. It always helps me to come together as the church and to lift my heart and my mind to God Almighty. It recharges me. But more than your presence here this morning, we need your presence outside of these walls. Just as Jesus became known, we will become known throughout this world as people building the kingdom of God. Our gifts. Now I said I talk about money when I come to churches, stewardship. That scares a lot of people. Jesus gave the, God gave the greatest gift of all, his son Jesus Christ. That was our gift from God, free of charge, nothing needed, just accept it. Well, my friends, God, I think, calls on us to become known by also giving. In the Old Testament, we read that benchmark of 10% and say we need to give the tithe. In 2014, United Methodists gave about 1.85% of their annual income to the church. Now, it may have been more than that to other things, but to the church, it's 1.85. And I don't say that to disparage you. I say that to let you know we understand John Wesley's idea that we are on the road to perfection. Now, a lot of us would like to say, but we're the New Testament church. Jesus never said a word about that 10%. And you're absolutely right, he didn't. But what is the one passage of Scripture that is the favorite of pastors when they're doing Stewardship Sunday? The story of the widow's mite. How much did she give? She gave it all. Friends, we're going to sing in a few minutes. I surrender 10%. No. We surrender what? We surrender all, all to Jesus. We surrender. That's our gift. We should be using our opportunities, our abilities, our assets, ourselves as gifts for God to use for the world in which we live. Our service. When I was young, about 19 years old, I was doing some work for our local church in Coppers Cove, Texas. And one of my uh, opportunities was to visit those saints who could not make it to church. So I went to visit a lot of shut-ins. And one day in Colleen, Texas, I was walking down the hallway of one of the nursing homes to go see one of our saints. And I heard this voice, hey, you. And I stopped. And then I heard, yeah, you, come in here. And I walked into this room where I'd heard the voice, and there lay Frankie Gilbert, a quadriplegic. And his head was all crooked. And he said, would you fix my pillow? So I fixed his pillow. We began to talk. And when I'd go back to see the saint, I'd stop in and see Frankie. One day he became a Christian. And then one day I said, Frankie, you ought to join the church. He says, what do I need to do? I said, we're going to want you to pray. He says, Ted, I lay around here all the time. I'm sure I can find some time to pray. I said, that's great. We're going to want you to be present. He says, you mean go to church? And I said, yes. 
He says, fantastic. I love to get out of this building. Anytime someone comes to get me, I'll go to church. I said, wonderful. I said, we're going to want some gifts. And he says, well, I'm not sure I can be helpful there. Uh, the government takes care of me. But I do sell Tupperware and candy on the side here. I can give something. I said, you pray about it. You work that out with God. I said, we're also going to want a service. And he says, well, there's the problem. What does a quadriplegic do for the church? Now, he had the ability to feed himself. They'd put this thing on his hand. He could feed himself. He also had a phone. He could get the receiver to his ear, and it had these big block numbers on it, and he could knuckle a phone number. And it seemed to me that he had the ability to call at the most inopportune time. We've all had those kind of phone calls, right? It was after one of those phone calls that it hit me. Frankie can dial the phone. So we took him a list of names and phone numbers of our committee members. We'd call him Monday morning and say, now the trustees meet Wednesday night, Frankie. You need to call the trustees. You know how difficult it is to get a call from a person you know is a quadriplegic in a nursing home and try to give them an excuse to why you can't be at a meeting? <laughs> what a blessing that was. Every member of this church should prayerfully discern what kind of a service is God calling them to perform in order to help the ministry of this church and to build the kingdom right here in Mount Vernon. Witness. We added that back in 2008 at General Conference. And I'm not sure what they wanted with that. When I, when I first read it, I thought maybe they want us to stand out on the street corner with these Jesus tracks, you know, and pass those out. Now, I'm not sure that's what we need to do. I'm not saying we shouldn't. It might be helpful. But then a name came to my mind. And the name was Leon Martin. When I was appointed to the church as the youth and education director, Leanne Martin was teaching the third and fourth grade Sunday school class. She'd been there for a hundred years, I was told, before I got there. She was there every Sunday. She, uh, if she wasn't going to be there, she got her own substitute. She ordered her own material. She used United Methodist material. I didn't have to do a thing for Leanne Martin. I loved her to death. I was there about nine months, and the senior pastor and I were having a meeting one afternoon, and he says, Ted, I think we're going to have to let Lay and Martin go from teaching third and fourth grade Sunday school. I said, what are you talking about? She's there every Sunday. If she's not, she gets her own substitute. She orders her own materials. She uses United Methodist material. What is wrong? He says, well, I've had some calls from some of the third and fourth grade Sunday school boys' parents. And she hugs them, and they don't like it. Now, this was way before we were worried, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be worried about that. I'm just saying this was way back when. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to watch a couple of Sundays, see what's going on before I do anything. I tried to beat her to church three Sundays in a row and didn't do it. I don't know how she got in before the janitor who unlocked the doors, but somehow she was able to do that. She was there all three Sundays. And sure enough, every child that came in, she gave them a hug, and you could tell. The boys didn't like it. Guess what happened on the way out? <laughs> she hugged them all again, and the boys still didn't like it. But here's what I saw the three Sundays that I watched. After Sunday school, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, twelfth grade, and college kids, when they were home, came by Layton's room. Guess what they wanted? They wanted their hug. What a witness. My friends... Jesus gave the world a hug. My friends, we become known by giving the world in which we live a hug. A hug in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My prayer for you this morning, my prayer for this church, every church, is that you will become known. And the kingdom will get a little closer for those who are much in need of a hug. Let us pray. Good God, we are thankful and humbled to be called the children of God, unworthy as we are. It is your grace and mercy that are so prevalent in our lives. Our prayer this morning is that you will help us to begin, become known. Give us the wisdom, the courage, the knowledge that we need in order to bring your love and grace and peace wherever we live and to the world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.